Linda Gorton is no stranger to Lexington. She's a graduate of the University of Kentucky College of Nursing and worked as a nurse for a local physician. She's been a passionate community advocate, serving on numerous boards and volunteering for various organizations. Mayor Gorton already has 16 years of service on the Lexington Fed Urban County Council, four terms representing the 4th District, one term as council member at large, and one term as vice mayor. In November, she was elected mayor of Lexington. On behalf of Commerce Lexington, I want to thank Mayor Gordon for her engagement with the chamber, business leaders, and other public officials, not only here in Lexington, but from around the region and the state, and I have to believe you've probably already been out to DC or soon will be. That engagement is important, and we had a luncheon uh, not that long ago with regional leaders, and it couldn't have gone better, and I appreciate you stepping up and stepping out to help show uh, Lexington and putting our, fist, uh, our uh, foot forward. Some of the issues important to the business community include workforce development, job creation, and the opioid epidemic, and it is an epidemic. We look forward to your leadership and are excited to hear more about your priorities for 2019 and how the business community can support and work alongside you. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Linda Gordon. Mayor. Thank you very much, Bob. And uh, Nick, your video was wonderful. And I so appreciate that you said that um, you're all about your employees, because I have often said that government is all about people. So we're tracking right there on the people. So good afternoon. And thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's clear to me that this is a room full of no-nonsense, results-oriented, get-it-done people, business people, self-made men and women. So for today's speech, I've prepared a no-nonsense, results-oriented, get-it-done report on a couple of the areas I've been concentrating on in my first six weeks in office. But first, I want to tell you a little about celebrating. If you, you might already know this if you paid attention to the Kentucky-Tennessee game. But uh, I know all of you are aware that the Cats took on the former number one team in the country Saturday and won. Yay, go Big Blue, right? <laughs> but... <clears throat> You may not know that I took on Kane. Does anybody here know who Kane is? A few people. I did not. Um, it was, it was mare to mare, a friendly wager on the game. So for those of you who aren't students of world wrestling entertainment, Kane is the stage name for Glenn Jacobs now the mayor of Knox County, Tennessee. He and I, he called me on Saturday and he said, let's have a friendly wager on the game. And so we did that and thank goodness the Cats won because <laughs> Glenn Jacobs, AKA Kane, he's, he's seven feet tall and he's 300 and some pounds. He is coming to town to make good on his bet, and as a wrestler, when he was wrestling, he weighed in at 323 pounds. And so the photos of the two of us should be interesting, to say the least. <laughs> I'm here, he's probably up there. <laughs> so it's just real clear that I did not rely on size to win. Uh, there is a serious side to this, and when he comes, the wager includes that he will wear a blue and white UK jersey and take me to lunch. Now, think about the dimensions I just told you about. We're having a little trouble finding that jersey. 
7 feet, 323 pounds. But there is a very serious side to this. When Glenn Jacobs and I have lunch, we're going to talk about something that's very important to both of us, and that is the opioid addiction and recovery issue. He has some really interesting ideas, and we will see what we can learn from each other, and if there are any possibilities for partnerships. We are just down the road, about three hours, and I, thank goodness, don't have to wear orange when I go down there. So finding an effective way to treat opioid addiction is one of the areas I've been concentrating on in my first six weeks. It's important to our entire community because opioid addiction affects our entire community. It touches every demographic, businesses, schools, churches, families, everyone. And it's detrimental to our labor force. It diverts funding from much needed initiatives and it has stolen the future from many talented Lexingtonians. I have a dedicated staff member in my office, Andrea James, who I think is here. Would you mind, there's Andrea. And she is to focus and is focusing exclusively on this issue. And she's hit the ground running. She is researching Fayette County's data and status relative to addiction and overdose. We know we are the number two county in the Commonwealth, only behind Jefferson County in the severity of our problem. She has met with over two dozen organizations, nonprofits, our courts, and the city that are actively involved in addressing the opioid em epidemic in Lexington. She's identified over $3 million in grants that are in place to help fight this fight in Lexington. She has talked to the Health Department, which operates our needle exchange program. It has compiled numbers that offer a more detailed picture of the epidemic here. Here are a few of the Health Department's statistics. While the number of overdose deaths in Lexington continues to grow, the rate of growth is slowing. That's good news. In the three and a half years our needle exchange program has existed, over 800,000 needles have been distributed to 4,200 different people. 800,000. Those people are 58 percent male, 42 percent female, 23 to 46 years of age, and almost half say they have overdosed at least once. Three-fourths say heroin is their drug of choice. The health department has distributed 1,800 naloxone kits through the needle exchange program and 174 cases of hepatitis A have been reported in Lexington with illicit drug use reported as a factor in about three-fourths of those cases. Those numbers add up to a serious problem for our community. Andrea's work continues with research of best practices in other cities. After gathering the available information, <clears throat> I will assemble a multidisciplinary group that will craft a comprehensive action plan for Lexington. And clearly, we have no time to waste. We have to address this now, and we need your help and support. Now, on to jobs. Another priority for my first six weeks in office and something we will work on every day for the next four years is jobs. Recent initiatives have given us the opportunity for significant economic growth. Kevin Adkins, who is here today, there he is, Kevin Adkins, my chief development officer, is working hard to ensure that we take full advantage. We will soon be one of the largest gigabit cities in the country. We want to be ready to take this leap into tomorrow's economy, and we are developing an aggressive plan to prepare. We are working to attract businesses to 250 acres that have opened up for economic development through a partnership with UK. The Lexington Industrial Authority, which is managing that property, met for the first time. 
Its initial focus will be the 50 shovel-ready acres that are available at Coldstream Research Park. A 200-acre tract fronting on the interstate will be available in about 2020. So I want to thank UK President Eli Capilouto and his team, especially Eric Mundy, for working with us. And I want to thank Tom Harris, who is also here today. Thank you. We will also be working to promote Lexington Opportunity Zone in the next coming months. This effort, which provides federal tax relief to developers, will be a focus to help in our efforts for infill redevelopment within the zone. Efforts that we hope will lead to additional jobs for those who live in and around the zone will be there. Experts agree we also have potential for significant economic growth in high-tech agriculture. We are well positioned to be a national leader in the field, and I am so excited about this. First, I want to welcome again Commissioner Ryan Quarles. His staff is working with our economic development team already. Ryan has been instrumental in leading efforts to bring hemp to Kentucky, and so Commissioner, we appreciate your support. Thank you, and your leadership. University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment, Dean Nancy Cox, is also working with us. Dean Cox, there you are. Thank you so much for your leadership and for being here. There is no College of Agriculture better connected to every aspect of the industry, from individual farmers to multinational agriculture companies than UK. They are a huge resource for our city and our state. And finally, I am so thrilled to have Dr. Mark Lyons here from Alltech. He is also working with us. We are strengthening these partnerships and working together on this high-tech ag initiative. We have discussed and our teams are working toward a more concentrated effort on recruiting high-tech agriculture to Lexington. Mark has led an effort to get many of our CEOs together to collaborate on what we can make Lexington and how we can be more competitive for companies. Mark, thank you very much for all you are doing. Alltech is a pioneer in the high-tech agriculture and we are proud you make your home and your corporate headquarters here in Central Kentucky. Thank you. To support this work in high-tech agriculture, I've asked Ashton, Dr. Ashton Potter Wright, our local food coordinator, to take a larger role in economic development. She is also with us today. Ashton has done a wonderful job promoting agriculture through Bluegrass Farm to Table. She has established relationships with over 80 farmers in 30 counties, generating over $2.5 million in sales for small and medium-sized farming operations. She is ready to assume a new role, helping develop a plan to make Lexington a leader in high-tech agriculture. Her duties will include cultivating relationships with the hemp industry as we position Lexington and Central Kentucky as a leader in the burgeoning hemp sector. Partnering with area distilleries and craft breweries to integrate local agriculture products into their purchasing plans. And finally, helping focus Coldstream development on ag-related businesses. We are also expanding the role of our workforce development manager, Elodie Dickinson, who's also here today. Since she came on board in 2016, Elodie has been working almost exclusively on our workforce training grant program. Elodie's new assignment is to work more with local businesses and focus on local workforce needs. That includes all of you. In order to attract and grow jobs, we must be sure we have the right workforce in place to meet the needs of local companies. For example, Elodie will work with people like Lyle Hanna, whom I saw earlier. He's here someplace. There he is. Um, Hanna Research Group helps employers find the workforce they need 
by connecting employers to workers through technology. In addition, a portion of our workforce grants will target training in certifications and licenses that directly relate to the needs of our local businesses. We will also work on making re-entry into the workforce a reality for more of our citizens. Elodie will continue to work with agencies like Jubilee Jobs, which helps people who are unemployed or underemployed find entry-level jobs. I know Carrie Plummer is here today. Thank you, Carrie, representing Jubilee Jobs. Carrie, thanks for all you do to make sure we have the trained workers we need. I enjoyed learning about it from you a week or so ago. So, <clears throat> as you can see, it's been a busy six weeks, and I like to say, and some of you here have heard it before, many opportunities are missed because they come dressed in overalls and look like work. And that doesn't happen here in Lexington because our citizens are always willing to roll up their sleeves and do the hard work. So I want to thank each and every one of you who are part of the business community and the workforce that you bring to us. It's critical to our success here in Lexington. Thank you very much. Oh, and I have to Bob. stay here. Okay, I think we're doing questions. And anybody else who wants to answer them, come up and join me. <laughs> There's room for all of us up here. As you can see, our mayor's hit the ground running, and we appreciate all the hard work you're doing for the community addressing Thank these you. issues. So we've reached the time in the program uh, where you should have, or should be, or can still do, uh, put some questions up there for the mayor. She's agreed to answer some of these for about 10, 10 minutes or so. So if you're ready, we'll start. Ready. What can we as business leaders and our colleagues do to help address the opioid crisis? We want to take concrete action, but how should we do this? Okay. And that, I get asked that everywhere, and I know Andrea gets asked that everywhere. So we do need your help. And a couple of the ways I'll just mention are that once we get our uh, through our data and our best practices search, we are going to need some of you to sit on this multidisciplinary group that will move forward with a strategy for Fayette County. That's number one. Number two is that we are talking about how we can educate employers and people like you in the business community to understand that addiction is a disease. Um, these are people who need treatment and rehabilitation, and then they are going to need jobs. So we're going to be working really hard to help our business owners understand that this, we are able to do this, to hire these folks, and I know that some businesses have already done this. Um, I, I go back to the, um, uh, the meeting where Rob and Diane Perez were honored for their work with DVA Kitchen, and there are other businesses in town that are starting to take a look at this. How do we do this? This is going to be big because many of you are in a situation where it's difficult to find all the employees you need. They either can't pass a drug screen or they're just not out there. These will be people who will be rehabilitated, who will be able to pass a drug screen, and who will be able to work in your business and industry. Um, so we're going to be coming to the business community to do this. To hire people and it's going to be critical to our workforce and um, you know if you're addicted you can't heal yourself and so if you have hypertension you can't heal yourself if you have diabetes you can't heal yourself you need help from medications and physicians and this is what we'll be about so um, if any of you 
we're identifying grant monies right now, which will go toward um, programs where uh, folks can get in the program, go into rehabilitation, and come out with some job training and then move into jobs. So those are a few things that I think of just right off the top of my head. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> what policy initiatives are you considering bringing forward to entice employers to locate or expand in Lexington? Oh, that's a very good idea. <laughs> um, you know, I talked about the Opportunity Zone, which some of you know a lot about. And one of the things I have said for many years is we need incentives to bring people into the urban service area with jobs. And one of the things that, on a little different tack, that we're going to do with this 50 acres at Coldstream is we're going to have an intentional plan. We're not just going to go get any job we can find. We want it to be very intentional and uh, planned out. And that's what the industrial board will be helping us do. But I think one of the things we can do right now is look at incentives and talk with some of our business leaders, some of you all, about what you know that works in other places. And um, that'll be critical. What are the city's priorities for infrastructure improvement critical areas, roads, broadband, water, sewer? Mm -hmm. Well, water and sewer are always priority. And you know we are under a consent decree and we are repairing about five, six hundred million dollars worth of stormwater and sewer facilities and that's ongoing. And we have a great guy who's heading it up, Charlie Martin, who many of you know. And so that is ongoing. The council and the mayor have, for several years, put several million dollars into road resurfacing because we understand that if, you know, if our citizens are having to drive across potholes every day, they're not happy. And we have, uh, it's important to have good roadways. We have the Breeders' Cup coming next year, and we want our roads to be in good shape. We want our infrastructure to be in good shape. Uh, everywhere I go, people ask me about a new city hall. If you have been paying attention to the news, you know that we are in a difficult budget cycle right now. And so about two weeks into my term as mayor, I was asked to meet with the CAO and the budgeting folks, and they gave me the news. Um, every mayor wants to come into a healthy budget that we're going to make and have leftover money, right? Uh, this is not the case. And so right now we are in the process of cutting $2 million out of our budget. We are doing it by frosting our um, hiring. We're not hiring for vacant positions. And we are doing it by encumbering some monies that different divisions haven't used. So you, this is nothing new to you all. You've read about Louisville. They have similar problems. Cities all over the country are experiencing this problem with their budgets. And so there, my, my viewpoint is there won't be a city hall right now um, because that's a, a pretty significant cost, even if, even if it's a P3 where the developer takes the risk. Our, um, just so you know, our debt service is at 12%. For those of you who are familiar with government, you know that the best practice is that your debt service stays at 10% of your revenue. Ours has crept up, and so there will be nothing rolling off of it for at least the next, this year and next year. So we're just being real, um, you know, it's like we do at home. We're being very careful with our budget and our money, which is the taxpayer dollars, and we're hoping that we can do this and remain whole through this budget year. And then next year we will have a significant challenge. So we'll be putting that budget together 
uh, this is February. I'm going to start having budget hearings here in a couple weeks. So, sorry to throw that downer in, but but I think it's you know I think people need to know this, you know, and um, and just uh, understand what we're doing. And I'm an optimist. I am. I, I was on the council when Pam Miller had to cut the budget. I was on the council when Jim Newberry cut the budget. The first term of Jim Gray when he cut the budget. This is cyclical, and we will we will make this work. So, what are your plans to make Lexington a more business friendly community? Uh, well, I'm always looking at cost of living. I think cost of living is number one, and um, when businesses look at a community and they see a high cost of living which will be put onto their employees, they're not real excited about going there. And so in terms of attracting new business, I'm always looking at those things which keep our cost of living low. Now, many of you understand that our land here is expensive. Uh, we have a as a community have chosen through numerous surveys and meetings with the public, we have chosen to have a tight growth boundary. And the, the voters have elected officials who believe in a tight growth boundary. But this comes with some trade-offs. And so I think that incentives for new business to come here understanding that for current businesses we need to make the regulations work and make them not onerous on the business. Um, last year during the campaign I met with several craft breweries. They wanted to meet with me and they said, you know, the regulations you have make it very difficult to open a brewery here. Well, we need to listen to that and look at what policies we can change in those kinds of sectors. And I, of course, I would like to hear from you all. What is making it more difficult? This will be the final question. Okay. How can we assure that housing remains affordable for all citizens, employees, as our city grows? Yes, um, we are about I think we're about 320,000-ish, and next year is the census. So we'll, we'll have final numbers there. And um, affordable housing is critical. If any of you know very much about California, for example, there are communities in California where you can't live there if you're a police officer, a fireman, a corrections officer, a teacher, a nurse. You can just name them off, the service workers, because you can't afford it. And we have, um, when I was vice mayor, we started our affordable housing fund, and it has been very successful. And it has been used by folks in the community who are opening up housing. And um, we've got to keep that going. When we get in a better budget position, I think we need to have a little more money in it because it's being, it has been used very successfully. And um, so that's, that is really critical to that effort. And can I throw in one other quick thing? I don't know the numbers. Uh, I read them last week, but homelessness, our numbers of homeless people are dropping. So for all of you who have had any kind of effort with the homelessness issue, we are slowly going down in our numbers. It was quite fortuitous that we did our annual count on that night when it got the coldest it's been in, in years. So most of the homeless went into shelters where they could be counted. So it was a pretty accurate count. And that's good news for us, community. And getting those folks into mental health services so that they can then be a little more productive is important to us too. We're working on it. So, Mayor Gordon, thank you for being here thank today. You for we appreciate me. you sharing some thank insights. You very much. And with that, that concludes our public policy luncheon for today. Thank you all for coming.